to watch The Prince for a long time, basically since it was first announced. As soon as I heard the premise, I knew, oh yeah, this is going to be my jam. I even named my last Pathfinder character Hotspur after one of the main characters of the play, so you can imagine how long I've been hyped for this. When it had its run in London, the real London, not the fake one where I used to live, I was consumed with overwhelming FOMO and read every review and interview that I could. And now, thanks to Nebula, I can watch it on my couch, in my pajamas, without ever leaving my apartment, as William Shakespeare intended, no doubt. I'm not sponsored by Nebula, by the way. It's just literally the only way you can watch it. Uh, for those of you watching that have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about, The Prince is a play written by and starring Abigail Thorne, best known as Philosophy Tube here on YouTube. It's about a small group of people trapped in the Shakespearean theatrical universe, some of which don't even know that they're in a play. Uh, most of it takes place within Henry IV Part One. This isn't going to be a review or a recap or anything. Uh, this video instead is going to be using the prince as a lens to talk about a bunch of personal shit that's been on my mind for a long time. But if you want my quick three second review, here it is. It's good. Go watch it, forehead. Even if you never watch anything else on Nebula, it's worth however much the membership costs. Again, not sponsored by Nebula. I'm going to get into spoilers for the play, so no worries at all if you need to click off of this video until you get a chance to watch The Prince for yourself. This is also going to be a much more emotionally heavy video than what I usually make, so if you're not in the right place for that, I completely understand. I have a video about Mechagodzilla that people seem to really like, so if you need a laugh, I got you fam. <laughs> All that out of the way, let's begin. play even for? It's for Abigail Thorne. She's clearly working through her own shit here, which we'll get into later in the video. Now, I'm going to disclose my bias here. I feel a special connection with her. To be perfectly clear, we're not friends. I don't know her. I've never met her, never talked to her, never had any meaningful interactions with her. I doubt she even knows that I exist. This is a completely one-sided parasocial connection that I have with her. While I watched Philosophy 2 videos here and there for many years, I didn't become an Abigail Thorne Giga fan until her coming out video. As a trans woman myself, it's not at all surprising that I feel strongly about anyone coming out as trans, particularly someone that I'm already familiar with and look up to. But what hit me especially hard with Abigail specifically is the timing. It released as I was preparing to come out publicly myself, a mere month or two before my own announcement. After my initial shock wore off, and let's be honest, my intense jealousy of how much prettier she is than me, <laughs> I started working out the timeline of events. I went back and I looked at older videos and noticed when she shaved her trademark goatee, when she started growing out her hair, when others stopped using male pronouns to refer to her, when she started experimenting with more feminine costumes. And well... The timeline of when I did all those things more or less lined up. I had a shaved head and a beard for a very long time. And when I started transitioning, I got comments from people like, oh, your hair is getting longer or when's the beard coming back? I started low key wearing women's clothes to the office and experimented with more feminine mannerisms and body language. So I realized something really profound that day. Well, you know, profound to me anyway. Abigail and I started our respective journeys around the same time. We were hitting our milestones, finding the euphoria of discovering our true gender, experiencing the agony of dysphoria, dealing with the frustration of an indifferent and ineffective system, overcoming the terror of telling that first person who we really are, and the repeated terror of wondering if the next person we tell will be the first one that reacts negatively, agonizing over every detail of how and when we're ready to let go of our biggest secret. The one that's been eating away at us for our entire lives. We did all those things together and I didn't even know it. Before I came out, I didn't know a single trans person I could talk to. 
Even though I had people in my life that were very supportive, I largely did that part of my transition alone. It certainly didn't help that I started this journey a short time before a pandemic came in and cut me off from any way to go out and meet other trans people. I had to figure out my early transition myself. And while I do pride myself on being self-reliant, it certainly was lonely. Finding out that there was someone out there going through the same stuff I was at the same time and someone that I admired and looked up to at that, well, it made me feel less alone. I read some of Abigail's interviews where she experienced something similar, having to go through that part of her transition alone, and my heart breaks. I wish... I wish we were friends back then. Not for clout. Not to, for, oh, look at me, I know a famous person. Not to aggrandize myself. I don't care about such things. I wish we were friends for the simple reason that we're two human beings going through a similar difficult experience. And you understand what the other is going through. In that timeline, we wouldn't have had to go through it alone. Oh, no, I know Hamlet. And what he might say with irony, I say with conviction. What a piece of work is man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form, in moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. Who is this play even for? It's for me. I almost feel as if Abigail reached into the dark recesses of my mind and wrote something for me specifically. I have something of a long and complicated history with Shakespeare. What many of you watching this may not realize is that I named myself after the character Miranda from The Tempest. Without going into the whole story of the play, she's a young woman that has lived her whole life isolated from the rest of humanity. When she meets people for the first time, she remarks, I'm a brave new world that has such creatures in it. It is new to thee. This character has always resonated with me, and I told myself for a long time that if I ever had a daughter, I would name her Miranda. When I realized I was trans, I took the name for myself instead. It seemed appropriate. I had lived in my own exile of sorts for my entire life, denying the truth of my own existence. When I came out, it was as though I was joining the world myself for the first time. But Miranda of the Tempest said in naivete, I said in earnestness, Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. I even have a print of John William Waterhouse's Miranda of the Tempest in my apartment. So it may surprise you to learn that I've never actually read The Tempest. Like I said, I have a weird relationship with Shakespeare. I almost didn't graduate high school partly because of Hamlet. Let me explain. Despite being something of a child prodigy, I had a major blind spot when it came to the humanities and had especially had a hard time with writing. I could do calculus with my eyes closed, but asked me to write a few paragraphs about Mr. Darcy, and it was a good chance I'd be handing in a blank page with my name on it. Obviously, I can write now. I mean, the words I'm saying are from a script that I wrote. I've been a freelance writer and an editor. I've written academic papers, both in school and professionally. I get tapped at my day job specifically because people seem to think that I'm a good communicator. Looking back, it's pretty clear that my inability to write essays was never a case of lack of talent. It was anxiety. And Shakespeare was the height of that anxiety. Not only did having to write in general cause me paralysis-inducing panic, I didn't understand a bloody word of it. I didn't understand a bloody word of that. And you know what else caused me a lot of anxiety? Public speaking. So imagine, if you will, 16-year-old me being told that a good chunk of their English mark was writing on their ability to memorize Hamlet's to-be-or-not-to-be soliloquy and deliver it to the entire class. I didn't get much past the first sentence. I think I literally said something something undiscovered country, which I could only remember because it's the title of a Star Trek film. Though I can count on one hand how many Shakespeare plays I've read, one of the ways I do engage with this work is through adaptations and references in other media, particularly Star Trek. The Undiscovered Country is, of course, laden with references to Shakespeare, and it's where we get this little nugget. You've not experienced Shakespeare until you have read him in the original Klingon. 
Star Trek writers over the years have peppered episodes and films with references to the Bard, with some episodes being outright retellings of certain plays, such as Requiem for Methuselah from the original series. While not a great episode, we see Captain Kirk take on the role of Ferdinand in The Tempest. The whole The Tempest, but in space, had already been done 13 years earlier in the classic Forbidden Planet, but I saw it first in Star Trek. Incidentally, the Prospero and Miranda analogs in Forbidden Planet have the last name Morbius, so do with that what you will. One major difference with Requiem for Methuselah is this version of Miranda, Reyna, doesn't gain her freedom, instead getting a tragic ending. She falls in love with Kirk and is unable to reconcile her conflicting desires to leave with him or stay with her father. Either way, she hurts someone she cares about. Oh yeah, uh, she's also an android and this overloads her robot brain, so she just dies. Growing up being perceived by society as a boy, I was supposed to imagine myself as Kirk there. And I did. But as I got older, I also saw myself in Reyna, torn between my desire to leave everything I've ever known to be truly free and the fear of what I'd be leaving behind, those hurt in my wake. I took all those feelings and I packed them into a little box, never to be opened again. Not until I finally cracked my trans egg. I have a whole video about that, so I'm not going to dwell on it here, but suffice it to say, I've been on quite a journey with Shakespeare. His plays went from being a source of frustration and anxiety to appreciation of the richness of the human experience, to a source of comfort and inspiration, and finally, a core part of my identity. At the end of this video, I'm going to do Mrs. Robbins, my old high school English teacher, proud and perform to be or not to be. I ain't memorizing that shit, though, because fuck that. Who do you think I am? Some kind of actor? <laughs> On your feet, Prince Hal. These wars make men of us. Are you a man? We have no use for women on the field. Who is this play even for? Every trans person. One of the themes of the prince is the roles that society places on us. Obviously, societal roles are a bit more rigid in the world of Henry IV, but it's not much of a stretch to see how this theme is still relevant today. The characters in the play struggle with the role that they've been given and eventually learn to reject them. And what is transness, if not the ultimate rejection of the most fundamental role society places on us? We're told from birth to perform the gender role to which we're assigned. Before we can even walk, we're given costumes and props based entirely on what parts we have between our legs. That is thy role. It is what God and nature hath assigned. For most people, this is the first and last role they play, and they never question it. When I said that Abigail was clearly working through her own shit with this play, this is what I was talking about. Casting a trans woman in the role of Hotspur in Henry IV Part I is a stroke of genius. This character has so much dude bro energy, constantly held up as a paragon of maleness, constantly valued for his role as a man, a soldier, a son, a husband. He's literally compared to Hercules. Not only that, but also constantly putting down anything womanly or feminine. Being called girlish is enough to send him into a murderous rage. Girlish? Oh, it's no surprise then that the character playing the role of Hotspur in The Prince has such a hard time breaking free from her imprisonment in the play. She's bought in so hard to her role that it takes repeated attempts from the awoken Jen, played wonderfully by Mary Malone, to get her to see the truth of her existence, both as a character in a play and as a woman. We see Hotspur's slow cracking reflected in the costume changes, starting out in full armor and shedding layers as the play goes on, becoming more and more feminine. Just as an aside, this play is full of lines with double meanings such as, these gilded garments fit me not, or all handsomely in male you are arranged. I see what you did there. When the way out presents itself, she just isn't ready yet, loudly asserting, my name is Harry Hotspur. I am a son. I am a nephew. I am princely. I am mighty. I am loved. And I am happy. And can you blame her? 
It's not easy to reject the box you've been placed in for your whole life. While I doubt that Abigail got whammied with sci-fi magic in real life, I'm reasonably confident that she wrote her own experience into this character. I think that every trans person that has spent a significant amount of time of their adult lives living as the gender they were assigned as birth can relate to the experience of taking a bit longer to find their truth. I know I can. I was a dude bro. I went through my hyper-masculine phase. I had a denial beard. The whole shebang, no pun intended. My masculinity was my suit of armor. It kept me safe during a troubled and turbulent childhood, adolescence, and early adulthood. But it was a character I was performing. I bought in hard to my role as a man. And while I didn't have a wonderful person come into my life to whammy me out of my self-delusion, I did have a similar brain-melting sci-fi magic experience. It was when I first started experimenting with my gender. I'm not a spiritual person at all. But I can only describe my first gender euphoria experience as well. Spiritual. For the first time in my life, I felt good about my body. It was though a veil had been lifted, and I knew in that moment there was no going back. It took me a long time to get there, but eventually I did realize it was time to reject the role that I'd been playing for nearly 40 years. This rejection of the role the world has us play from the minute we're born is so intrinsic to the trans experience, I'm surprised that it isn't a more common talking point. The barest essence of being trans is realizing you've been miscast and saying, no, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to find the right role and to hell with anyone who gets in my way. Now I'm going to have a bit of a hot take here. This essence or idea or experience or whatever you want to call it isn't limited to trans people. It's universal. Let me explain. Hotspur is hardly the only character in this play that rejects the role society imposes on them. Her wife, Lady Kate, played by Tiana Arnold, chafes under her traditional gender role. She was going to inherit her family's estate and so was educated and learned how to manage the affairs of a 15th century noble. That is until her brother was born and she was forced to give all that up to be Hotspur's wife, a role that leaves her unfulfilled. The titular Prince Hal, played by Cory Montague Chole, is a closeted gay man, pressured by his father to take on a wife and be more of a stereotypical man. His father, the king, openly wishes for the prince to be swapped with Hotspur so that he can have a son worthy of him he can be proud of. Hal has to kill a part of himself to play the role that everyone wants him to play. Anyone part of a marginalized group can see themselves in one or more of these characters. But I don't think it's limited to just those groups. Having the course of your life charted from you from the moment you're born, whether it's by your parents, your community, your religion, or society, it's a near universal human experience. It transcends gender, race, and class. There's a plethora of novels and films about this concept. Every coming of age story ever is on some level about someone reckoning with the role they were born into. And of course, this isn't limited to fiction. So who is this play for, really? It's for you. Yeah, you, watching this video right now. This play is for every girl who started a metal band instead of finding a nice husband. It's for anyone that didn't continue in their family business. It's for anyone who didn't become a doctor like their parents wanted. It's for anyone that left their small town to follow their dreams in the big city. It's for everyone that at some point in their lives needed to take some time to figure their shit out. Being trans is just another expression of this experience. If there's one thing I want people to take away from this video, it's this. We're not groomers. We're not degenerates. We're not weirdos. We're just people. We want to live and be happy and find the roles that are right for us, just like anyone else. Maybe if more people understood this, the world would be a little less hostile to us. There's one character I haven't talked about yet, and it's probably the one I identify with the most. 
It's Sam, played by Joni Ayton Kent, the first awoken character in the play. In her words, I've been down here a long time. Oof, that is a mood, girl. She's only interested in saving the cute girl that she likes and getting the fuck out of there. She's not interested in saving the other characters. In fact, she doesn't even see them as people and claims they're just NPCs. She's so fixated on escaping that when Jen starts to mess with her plans, she panics. When the moment comes to escape, she doesn't hesitate and leaves without a second thought for anyone left behind. And you can call it cowardice or selfishness if you want, but I understand where she's coming from. When you're trapped in a bad situation for a long time and you see an out, you cling to it like a security blanket. She's not able to make the choice that Jen does, to risk losing the chance of escape to save the rest. She doesn't even consider it for a single second. She can't go back. No, we won't go back! One of the ways that I knew for sure I was trans was when I had to confront the idea of going back. I had been experimenting with my gender presentation for a few months and had gotten into the habit of shaving my face every day. And while I was still presenting mail on video calls or whenever I went out, at home I had all the freedom in the world to dress or act however I wanted. I was pretty sure I was trans and I was going to start electrolysis to remove my facial hair. However, this meant that I would have to grow out my beard in between sessions. When I felt my face for the first time in a long time with hair on it, I experienced the worst dysphoria of my life. I sobbed and I cried for what felt like hours. I cried more that day than the rest of my adult life combined. And this wasn't the estrogen messing with my emotions. I hadn't even started HRT yet. Not that there is or ought to be a rite of passage for being trans, but if there was one, that was it. That was the strongest evidence I was ever going to get that I was on the right track and I was truly trans. Not that there is such a thing. Going back was no longer an option. Since I wasn't out yet, I was going to have to present mail for a while longer. But in my head, that was it. I was a woman. And if you told me that day that I had to turn around and not go through with it, with no guarantee that this opportunity would come again, well, I would pull a Sam there and give a good see you later, best of luck with that. Sam is also the character that has the greatest difficulty adjusting the life back in reality. Something else I can relate to. Sometimes the hardest part is what comes after. She escaped. Now what? I'm a woman. Now what? Is Miranda just another character I've been playing? I've played so many roles in my life. Son, daughter, brother, sister, nephew, niece. I've been a wunderkind, a college dropout, a drunk, a salesman, a grifter, a rambler, a gambler, a street fighting man. I've been a stockbroker, a writer, an academic, a pro gamer, a G-man. I've been a person of some means, and I've scraped by to survive. I've been on top of the world, and I've stared into the abyss. Now what? Am I Miranda or not? To be or not, or not to, be. to be. That That's is the question. question. Whether it is nobler, Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, fortune or, to or to take arms, arms against the sea of troubles, troubles and, and by opposing and end, end them. To, to die, die, to sleep no more, and by, and by sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, to is a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep, to sleep perchance, perchance to dream. dream. And I, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come, come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause. 
There is the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's continually. The pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes. When he himself might as quiet as make with a bare bodkin, who would fartles bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country, from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will, and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others we know not of. This conscious does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied over. But the pale cast of thought and enterprises of great, great pitch and moment, moment with this regard that currents that turn awry and lose the name, the name of action. Soft, Soft you now, the fair Miranda. Miranda. Nymph in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. Was it not one of the captain's favorite authors who wrote, this above all, to thine own self be true? So am I Miranda or not? Do I get to leave my island and experience the world for all its ugliness and beauty? Or am I Reyna, paralyzed by indecision and doomed to never know real happiness? To be or not to be? That speech is about suicide. And I'm reasonably sure that Shakespeare had depression. We can smell our own. You don't write a thing like that without knowing a thing or two about the temptation of ending things. It's something I've dealt with for my entire life, though it waxes and wanes in intensity. And let's just say it's been a full depression moon for a while now. Yeah, yeah, trans woman with depression, how trite, I know. I usually describe this feeling as not necessarily wanting to die, but not caring if you live or not. I've always been very cavalier when it comes to my life. I distinctly remember a time in my 20s. I was in a car with my friend who decided to play a little game of chicken with us. He said, I'm stepping on the gas and I'm not taking my foot off until someone says something. My response was, I'm prepared to die. Good joke. Everybody laughs, but I wasn't joking. As a teen, I didn't think I would live past 25. And when you think that way, you don't make plans or have goals. So I drifted through life, taking on all sorts of different roles, expecting that I'd die young one way or another. But I never did. And when I had that first gender euphoria moment, I felt true joy for the first time. Not the kind of happiness that comes from winning a big tournament or acing that math test or getting everyone at the party to laugh at your joke. Joy that comes from within, not without. For the first time, I cared about my life. I wanted to live. That trajectory might have well continued were it not for my typically horrible timing. The last three years of living in isolation have been hard. It's like I got on that boat with Ferdinand, only to be immediately shipwrecked alone on another deserted island without so much as a spirit for company. To be or not to be. Am I Miranda? Am I Reina? Or am I Hamlet? The real answer? Is that I don't know. Identity is not something you can just take a gap year to figure out completely and never have to think about again. It's a lifelong process. Who I am now is very different from who I was 20 years ago and will be very different from who I'll be 20 years from now. What I do know is being trans is not easy, not by a country mile. It's the most difficult thing I've ever done, still doing. But being trans also gives me a tremendous amount of joy. It's connected me with a community of some of the most amazing people I've ever met. As someone that has felt like an alien for most of their life, it's hard to describe the feeling of suddenly discovers out there who are just like me. 
While I certainly have regrets that it took me this long to get here, I did eventually find the exit. A wise man once said, figuring things out for yourself is the only freedom anyone really has. I choose to use that freedom. I choose this next role. Come what may, time and the hour runs through the roughest day. My name is Miranda. <laughs> Took a night for you to grab your phone All these fights with you, leave me alone And I'm walking away, walking away Don't wanna hear what you say, hear what you say If you keep talking away, talking away I just can't say, just go away Oh baby, just listen to me Obviously, I can write now. Uh, oh, okay. Another take. <laughs> what are you still doing here? Go away. 